So the topic for today is planting for diversity, specifically native species in urban environments. And uh, this presents a whole set of challenges that you might not be aware of, um, or you might be all too familiar with. And uh, hopefully you can learn some things and maybe pick something up to help you out along the way here. So first, you know, this is a wild ones presentation. So we're going to talk about why use native species. Uh, one of the first reasons, you know, it's greater opportunity is habitat for other animals. Um, it was mentioned before, you know, the insect larvae that are using the goldenrod and are being preyed upon to support the young birds. Um, they're adapted to the region. You know, some you know, there's a reason why Himalayan mountain birch don't grow outside the Himalayans, and it's they're adapted to their local regions. So using species that are adapted to the regions is going to give you a better opportunity for establishing those plants and for allowing them to thrive. Uh, resistance against endemic diseases and pests, you know, as these species are, are evolving with um, the, the, the pests and diseases, it's kind of an arms race to see who can get one over the other. So they're going to have some resistance. Now, a lot of the diseases and pests that we see that are really affecting uh, trees in our area, like emerald ash borer, these are not natives. And, the, the native ash just don't have um, a response to them. And, and that becomes a, a big problem. And once again, food source for insects and other animals. So it's it's not just the insects that will be using the trees, but also um, the fruits and seeds and other things. And I actually have, uh, if I can just find it here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Right. Um, so these are native trees to New Jersey, and if you scroll up here, you can see that the number is the number of bird species that feed on them, and this is just the fruits, seeds, cones, and catkins. This is not predation upon any insects, um, and, you know, red cedar has 32. Uh, the hickories are in the high teens here, and I think black cherry has the most with 53 species of birds eat the cherries that grow there every season. Uh, so, you know, it's not a small amount that, that um, these native trees are supporting. Uh, oh, these links, by the way, these are the links that will bring you to the actual scientific papers where you know, the research was done, if you want to see for yourself. Um, I believe the, the links will be in the chat later on. Okay, so I was saying, you know, diversity is not just the number of species. We have a, a couple Brian, of types of- I to interrupt you. We don't see your presentation. Oh. We just see the, the, the list of the trees, just so we... All right, you know what? I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare then, and that'll be the easiest way to do this. Thank you for sharing that list, that's awesome. Okay, start share. There we go. That's the one we want. Okay, so first up on the list is structural diversity. And structural diversity, uh, what this pertains to is, you know, the shapes of trees and their density. Um, for example, the difference between a, a hedgerow and um, a fern. It's a very different structure. You know, uh, one can support a bird's nest, the other cannot. And it's really important to be thinking about this because a lot of times we think about tree planting and we just go for the, you know, whatever trees we see at the nursery without really giving too much consideration of how similar of a structure do they have to whatever is already existing or to what we anticipate putting in later. So this chart here is just showing you the dis you know, differences in the sizes of trees. And that is a key component of structural diversity, but it's not the only component. Uh, genetic diversity is also very important. And as you can see here, this is actually the same species of frog. And they're displaying all these different colors and patterns. And they're all able to interbreed with each other and produce viable offspring. And this is just a naturally occurring thing that you'll see with most species, if not every single one of them. Uh, and then age diversity. Uh, so what we see here is a sample of trees in these different regions, and they were determining 
what the ages of the trees were by, you know, by taking the measurements and then plotting them in a chart. And, and you can see that in some areas, like the Northern Plains region, you have a bell curve. And then when you get to the Rocky Mountain South region um, or the South Central region in the bottom right hand corner, it's, you know, quite the opposite. Uh, I would expect this also to change a little bit based on the species as well. So for example, an oak hickory forest in New Jersey may not have the same age ranges as a, a maple birch forest. So that's another thing to consider is, you know, what species are being planted or what species you're managing and what they would naturally look like if they were to have um, a forest stands on their own. Um, oh, just real quick, uh, one of the reasons why age diversity is important is because we need to be able to replace old trees with new ones uh, at the same rate. And that, that's something that often gets overlooked. Uh, we allow the old trees to, to grow to overmature and then die. And then it's another 50 years before we even have anything close to that again. So I always suggest to people that if it's possible, if you have the resources, if you have the ability, plant young trees next to fully mature ones. And that, yes, they're gonna grow slower at first, but that's okay. They'll, they'll take over that space when the old one has to come out. So it's really nice to show all these charts and graphs about diversity and say, you know, there's structural diversity and age and genetic and all this. Um, and we wanna get to the ideal diversity. It's very unlikely that we'll ever have that. Uh, nature is just, there's too much in fluctuation at all times, but we can try. And especially if we have a very manicured landscape, whether it's a golf course, a park, uh, a city street, we have a much greater opportunity to, to make changes um, towards, towards ideal diversity. And so there's a couple components that I would suggest to focus on. Uh, a planting or management plan, the, you know, the species that you want, the size, the age, and the genetics, all in very basic terms. So we'll see, you know, with the management plan, I often suggest that a five-year period is best. Now, New Jersey, the Department of Environmental Protection does have a, a, a program where they will uh, approve management plans for uh, city trees or uh, municipal trees. Um, so that's, you know, generally that, that works. And uh, a big factor here is making sure that in the management plan, you have attainable, attainable and measurable goals. A lot of times people put in language that says, you know, we're going to improve the ecosystem or we're going to reduce runoff. Okay, that's great, but how are you going to attain that and how are you going to measure that? Um, because when you don't have these measurements in place, you don't think about it in terms of, you know, at the end of five years, we're going to have to do kind of an audit and see whether we reach these goals or not. It almost makes it that there, there'd be no point to having the management plan at all. Because if you're not going to try to attain the goals, if you're not going to see if you did reach them, um, then what's the point? You know, uh, instructions for achieving goals. It's not always going to be the same people who are who are using this management plan. You know, people come and go, they change jobs or if something happens. So it's important that the instructions are there so that it's not based off of what somebody knew a few years ago um, and that anybody can pick it up and, and look through it and figure out what needs to be done. And um, the last one, this is very rare, but I, I think it's very key. Uh, specifications for technical details and operations. I mean, when we say, you know, plant a tree in the city, uh, or in, you know, in between the sidewalk and the street, we think, okay, you know, you dig the hole, you put the tree in, but do you take the burlap away? Is, is there um, a way that the trees need to be handled coming off of, you know, the, the trucks? Uh, is there certain machinery that you don't want to be used? Are there certain digging techniques that, you know, have to be avoided because of, you know, possible utilities or contamination? Uh, these are all things that really should be in the management plan so that anybody can take it and, and get it done. And here's just an example of one of these technical specs where it's showing the tree inside uh, a typical, typical parking lot island, and it's showing the drainage, it's showing what kind of crushed stone material should be there, you know, how wide the root ball should be compared to um, the branching structure, et cetera. And again, you know, a, a contractor can look at this and, and get the job done right the first time. 
So it's very important to, to put these things in, uh, especially when there's going to be multiple people over long periods of time overseeing these projects. The 10, 20, 30 rule, this is something that I heard in just about every urban forestry class that I've, I've uh, taken or presentation I've been to. And it's no more than 10% of any particular species should be in, in your, your management zone. Uh, no more than 20% of any particular genus and no more than 30% of any particular family. Now this gets a little tough when you're using natives. Um, sometimes you have areas where it's really only suitable for a handful of species and you're not gonna be able to get to this level of, of species diversity. And that's okay, you know, that's gonna happen. But this is, you know, the general guideline. And this is, again, this is ideal. This is, if we could, if we could get it at every location, this is what we would want to see. So this is, again, um, the age diversity. This is the age classes in years. And this is the proportion of the forested area. And you can see most of them are within, you know, 10 to 20 percent, except for the oldest ones, which have survived all the storms and survived all of the diseases and attacks by pests, uh, loggers, etc. So this may not necessarily be reflecting um, what you would expect to see in a, in a forest in New Jersey, uh, particularly if you're looking at the Pine Barrens, you know, that's going to be a very different ecosystem than um, some of the, uh, the forests up north along the New York state border. So if you're going to be using some kind of chart like this to kind of get a gauge where your uh, trees should be or what they should look like, you're going to want to find out the, um, what would be natural in that region with those species. And again, like I, I mentioned, even within this area of New Jersey, we, we have different types of hardwood forests. So it, it might take some digging to, to find an accurate uh, representation of, of what a natural stand would look like. Um, but it would essentially look like this. And the way that you would get this data for yourself is you would do an inventory and you would go out and have people measure all the trees. And instead of maybe doing age classes, you might do size class and DBH. Um, that might be a, a, a decent proxy indicator for, for your trees. It's, it won't work for every species, but it's it's usually good enough. Diameter at breast height, that's the diameter tree at four and a half feet tall off the ground. And that can usually substitute in for age class generally. Um, again, this is the structural diversity. And as you can see, you know, the dogwood not only is it smaller, but it's much more compact than the ponderosa pine. The ponderosa pine is gonna have those spaces in between the vertical branches. Um, and the vertical branches are going to be coming off the main stem, whereas with the, the white oak, you'll have branching off of the major branches. You'll, you'll have um, a lot more fine branching. And this is important because different animals use different structures and also at different times of their life as well. You know, um, I, I, <clears throat> And uh, this is a representation of the uneven aged stand. As you can see, it's the young trees there, the small four. Then you have four medium sized and then two larger ones. And this is probably, you know, what you would expect to see naturally as well too. You know, more juveniles and medium aged trees and fewer older trees. That won't always be the case, but it's, it's a, I would expect that um, in, in this area especially areas that have previously been logged. Um, you know, we don't really think of it anymore, you know, logging in New Jersey, but it wasn't that long ago that most of these forests were cleared. So they're, they're regaining their natural structure. And this is what we're seeing as that process goes. This is just a little simple chart showing genetic diversity. Uh, it doesn't really mean that much to, to most people, I wouldn't think. Um, it's... <laughs> But it, it's just showing how, you know, the genetic diversity literally starts with the genes and it's in the individuals in that species. And the different combinations will produce further combinations, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have intra specific uh, genetic diversity that's within a certain species and then interspecies diversity. And that's the amount of different species altogether. Um, and then you can see how 
having that diversity in genetics goes into the um, species diversity, which goes into the proper functioning of the ecosystem. Okay, fulfilling the management plan. Uh, I always tell people the first step is an inventory because you can't manage what you don't know you have. So some people really like to do these exhausting, extensive inventories where they're including everything about the tree. If there's any defects on the sidewalks, uh, if there's anything that was hanging in the tree, um, you know, percent dead branches, percent canopy cover. I, you know, there's a time and a place for that, but I think for the most part, you just need to know the species, how big it is, and it, the general condition. And those three factors alone will give you um, the, the vast majority of data points that you need in order to come up with a maintenance plan uh, or to determine, you know, what's in the greatest need. Uh, planting plans. Uh, again, you know, as I said before, old trees should have new ones planted nearby if possible. I know a lot of times when a town is doing the planting, they have a very limited budget uh, and limited resources to, to get it done. And so they may be prioritizing locations with the fewest trees first, which I understand that makes perfect sense. And I would say that's probably the right decision. But if you do have the opportunity, you know, especially in park settings, you should definitely consider um, the replacement trees, what, you know, which trees are going to grow as replacements. Uh, codify the rules for proper planting species locations and when plantings can be denied. This is another big issue for municipal uh, plantings, especially. People say, oh, I don't want a tree in front of my house because then I'm responsible for the sidewalk or I don't want to, um, or I just don't like, Nobody asked me, and if they had asked, I might have said yes, but so anyway, you get all kinds of reasons why people say no, and it, it doesn't always have to do with the tree. Um, so, so having it in the municipal code that, you know, the planting that's upcoming, um, these are the, 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 this is the list of, of reasons why a tree can be denied. This is a list of reasons why it can't. That, that's important in getting it done. And um, also having in, uh, we've got the borough municipal code, you know, something about those technical specs. Now, in one of the towns I was working in, what they did is they put everything that they wanted in the management plan, and then they had the borough pass a resolution um, that said everything that's in the management plan has to be followed. So instead of trying to get everyone on the council to understand what was being proposed, they just said, could you just tell everyone they have to follow the plan? And they said, sure. Because um, it was approved by the state and, and everything, and it, and it made a lot of sense. So it was a, a kind of a political workaround, but I, it's it's important that these kinds of things happen. Um, training and, and equipping a management crew. You have the core training from the New Jersey State that they do at the Shade Tree Federation meeting every year. Uh, you have the International Society of Arboriculture, and then the licensed tree experts of New Jersey. Uh, I would say, you know, the ISA is probably the most common and the most valuable for general management. Uh, and that's something that I, I think more people should look into. And I would encourage uh, that also to be included into management plans as well, that we want people who are trained under with, with these minimum requirements um, and also provide them with, with the gear if possible, you know, especially uh, for volunteer dates. Choosing the right trait. So this is where it gets a little tricky in an urban environment because the urban environments are not conducive to growing really anything. Um, and that's our fault because we built it that way. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. We could build it better, but this was not something that was really thought of, you know, 50 years ago and we're kind of dealing with that still. Uh, so hardiness here, just, <clears throat> just excuse me a second. Mm -hmm. So hardiness is one of the biggest factors. For example, the service berry or shad bush or I, you know, the amelanch here, they're not a very hardy tree. So if you try to put it in the downtown area where there's a lot of foot traffic, they're throwing salt down on the sidewalks in the winter, there's air pollution from buses and cars, it's not gonna do well. And you could spend a lot of time and money trying to get it to grow there. And I don't think it's um, an economic use of time to do that. So a better choice would be a thornless uh, hawthorn or, so, or something of that nature. 
again, you do, you're, you're probably not going to be able to follow the 10, 20, 30 rule in those scenarios. Um, some people suggest that, okay, well then that should be a time where you use a tree that's not native if it's very uh, hardy and adaptable to the area. There's a couple schools of thought on this. Um, the one thing that I would say is, you know, in a highly, in a dense urban area like that, you don't really have a functioning e ecosystem. So you don't really have a lot of bird species that are going to be dependent upon caterpillars or insects in those trees. Um, it's not optimal, but I, I think a case could be made in certain circumstances that, yeah, those tough urban areas where natives just don't grow so well, maybe we put something in that's naturalized or, or isn't any danger to becoming invasive. Um, there's a lot of debate on this. We can skip that for today. Maybe that'll be another webinar. Um, choosing the right tree. Okay, understand that maintenance is unlikely to be timely, uh, performed correctly. Sometimes maintenance isn't going to be performed at all because there's just no one to do it. And, you know, there's been a, volunteers putting in trees and everyone's happy, but who's coming back? And who has the authorization to come back? This is something that often gets overlooked. So you shouldn't be planting trees thinking, oh, well, as it grows taller, it's okay. The DPW is going to come by and trim the branches so that it doesn't hit buses as they pass down the street. That almost never happens. So do not count on that. We call it truck pruning when the, the, the trucks or buses hit the branches growing into the street. So you might want to choose a tree that has a more compact shape, or maybe it doesn't grow so tall, or maybe you plant it further away from the curb to try to mitigate these, this problem. Um, there's, there's lots of you know, possible workarounds, but you should definitely be going into it on, um, with, the, with the idea that maintenance is going to be performed uh, incorrectly or not at all. Uh, consider the size of the specimen at purchase versus size fully grown. People don't do this, they still don't do this, and I don't understand. I mean, we, there's so many examples of trees that have outgrown their planting spaces, and that's not the tree's fault, that's our fault. We put that tree there, it shouldn't be there. Or we should have made the planting space bigger. One of the two. Um, the set it and forget it does not work with trees. They continue to grow. And also consider what ecological services are to be gained. So, you know, like if, if you are trying to plant for, for habitat, that's going to be different than if you're trying to plant for water absorption or for shade. Um, there's a lot of different things that trees can do and different species do them better than others. So you should really be thinking why, what do we want the tree to do in this location? And then you can look at um, what species could fulfill those, those roles. Uh, other considerations, yeah, standing deadwood. This is something that doesn't occur to a lot of people. And um, I don't know why. We, we have the idea that, you know, if a tree is dead, it needs to be taken down. Well, if it's a street tree, yes, that's probably true. Um, I can't think of many locations where you would want a dead tree along a street. But if it's in a park or it's on private property, you can just cut it at 10 feet tall and leave it, and it'll become habitat for all kinds of beetles and larvae and, um, and you know, Maybe even other, uh, you know, some birds uh, that that will, will hollow that will find a hollow and make a nest in there. Uh, squirrels will will use cavities in trees too. So just because a tree is dead doesn't mean it has zero value. I would say, as a street tree, you don't want dead trees, but parklands, um, forests, yeah, you don't need to go crazy taking them down. You could leave a stag, uh, a, you know, standing dead wood. Specimen trees. Um, having a tree as a centerpiece, as a focal point of a park. I, I've done this a number of times with willow trees where there was a depression that would always flood. And you know, people said, you know, what do we do? And I said, well, just plant a willow here and it'll grow nice and big. It'll take up that excess water and um, it'll, it'll be a, kind of a statement tree because you have, you know, lawns all around. So it'll, it, it'll be um, aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, Traditionally, specimen trees are usually put on, you know, in arboretums and places like that, and there tends not to be native. But I think it's in, definitely possible to, to find natives that can be used as specimen trees, um, particularly if, they're, if, if you're going for flowering. 
Uh, tree planting incentives. So one thing that had come up in some meetings when I was volunteering with the Shade Tree Commission was how to get people to plant a tree in their own backyard or their own front yard and not along the street, but which is what the Shade Tree Commission was already working on. And we tossed around the idea, you know, maybe we could we could give um, get the town to give them a tax break if uh, if they could keep the tree alive for a certain amount of years. And we would just do a once yearly inspection in the summer or spring or whatever. And um, if they, you know, every year that the tree is alive is a year that they get a credit. It didn't get off the ground. Everybody loved the idea, except uh, I guess when it when it got to council, they they had other things that they wanted to talk about. Um, so it never happened. But these are things that can be done. It, just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean it's not possible. So I would encourage everyone to think a little bit outside the box sometimes on how to get people to be better stewards or how to get them more engaged, or how to get them to just do it on their own. Mulching leaves instead of mowing, I, I tell everybody there's no reason to mow, or there's no reason to rake your leaves or, or get the, the leaf blowers out in the fall. Don't do it. Just mulch it, it'll break down, and if there's anything left in the spring, you can worry about it then. There's no absolutely no reason to get rid of the leaves. Um, I, and I've heard everything from it's illegal not to rake your leaves, to uh, it'll it'll change the soil pH and make it acidic. None of this is true. I mean, it's it's possible that there are some towns that had an ordinance. I would be very surprised if anybody ever enforces it, um, or that you couldn't just get a permit not to do it anyway if you wanted to. So these are just some examples of the standing deadwood, and as you can see. Um, this one tree is probably about, you know, 25 feet tall, 20 feet tall, and it's in a wooded area. No reason to take it down. Just leave it. Uh, and the tree next to it, you can see the cavity that's being used by some animals there, and then all the holes that are boring insects as well as woodpeckers. And this is an example of, of specimen trees. You know, it's got this bright, vibrant color. It's got this interesting kind of shape to it. Um, I don't know where these are native to, I'm not certain, but this is the kind of thing where you could put just one or a few of them together and and, and have it be a, a focal piece um, of the landscape. Uh, okay, so this is just, yeah, an example of, you know, why it's better to have trees planted on these larger properties. I mean, the space that you have between the sidewalk and the curb is much smaller than the lawn that the tree is planted in. And to get around the fact that the roots are sticking up uh, around the base of the tree, they just put a garden around it. So they have less lawn to manage, which is always a good thing. And they have more plant material there and it, it looks great and the tree is thriving. So these are examples of new parks that have been going in and how they're putting just some, you know, some wildflowers and meadows uh, instead of having the traditional lawn. And it's, it provides more habitat. It's also quite aesthetically pleasing. I mean, you, you have flowers that are gonna be blooming all season long, all through the summer. Um, and it requires such little maintenance. You really don't have to do anything. I, a lot of these, these plants that can thrive in, in this kind of environment also don't need to be watered. They, they can just take rainwater and they'll be just fine with that. And this is a, a, a second example of a wildflower garden. Same thing, it, this could be lawn, but why? Now you have this beautiful wildflower meadow here that's going to be bringing in butterflies and bees and hummingbirds and moths. Uh, you, you're just gonna have life thriving all around you. And again, you, you have to mow it maybe once every three years to keep woody species from growing. That's not a lot of effort. That, that's really simple and easy. And these are some native species uh, that often get overlooked. So a lot of the, the native species we talk about, um, we use as street trees. And a lot of towns don't like to have anything that's gonna drop stuff on the sidewalk. So they don't like you know, the, um, the female ginkgos. They don't want um, American persimmon, hickories, or walnuts because of the fruits that they drop. Personally, I don't see what the issue is. I don't understand why people can't just walk on top of it or um, you know, uh, have it just brushed off. It doesn't happen for very long out of the year. It's just a, 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 a maybe a week or two of the year where you have the fruits dropping. Um, 
But in any case, these are usually banned from being street trees, but they're perfectly good for your backyard. Uh, and you can even eat the, the, um, the persimmon and the walnuts yourself. I'm not certain about the hickory, uh, but I, I, I would expect that there's some species that is native to New Jersey that is edible, uh, in, maybe after being cooked. But um, yeah, so, so you know the, the list of trees that we consider for, for planting, um, it shouldn't just be what's, what you can find at your nearest nursery. It should be you know, what's missing from your management area. And your management area may be an entire town, it may be just one park, like I said, but that's really what you want to be considering uh, when we're, you're looking at all this diversity. Um, so species diversity, structural diversity, age diversity, and genetic diversity. Um, oh, I, I've missed one thing about the genetic diversity. Uh, even within species, this is really important. If you were to get red maples from Florida, and plant them in New Jersey, they're not going to do so well. Um, same thing if you get red maples from New Jersey and plant them in Florida, even though they're the same species, they have adapted to the different regions. And there's even some um, literature on the, uh, the adaptation being even within a couple hundred yards of each other. For example, um, an oak tree that's at the top of a hill versus the oak tree that's at the bottom of the hill. And collecting seeds from, or the acorns from these oak trees, it was important to label where they came from because when they were being planted um, as seedlings, you know, the, uh, the uplands trees were, were not doing well in lowland areas and vice versa. So even the same species in the same state park that, you know, you can practically see one from the other, they might still have enough genetic diversity uh, among them that uh, they're more or less suitable to different habitats. Uh, or microclimates or microhabitats, whatever you want to call it. So you know, all things to consider when when you're um, when you're picking your trees. Uh, I wouldn't. I would expect that anything in a nursery is probably meant for general use, so you wouldn't have to worry about that too much. You know, um, but if you are collecting seeds from from the wild, you should be conscious of uh, you know the elevation and the amount of water uh, in the ground where you're collecting. So that's all for my presentation. And um, now we'll turn it on for questions. Is my video on? OK, yes. I am visible. OK, that was, that was a fantastic presentation, Ryan. It was incredibly informative. You touched on so many things. I got a lot of people excited. I have just it's heard exploding with questions here in my um, community notes I'm keeping with uh, Haley and Gisela. And um, and I just, before I forget, I want to touch on the hickory nuts. Yes, you can eat them, except <laughs> for the pig nut, because the pig nut is high in tannins. And so what's really bitter, like an acorn is. And and the way you ID the, um, the pig nut is the nut itself is very round and smooth. Whereas the other varieties of hickory, the um, nuts are very angular. You know what I mean? They have that kind of angular shape to it. Like it has, they have ridges and they, they taste like incredibly rich. Like, like they taste like pecans, but like a pecan, like a much more buttery pecan. And, but it's, it's really hard to break the shell open. You have to have a special kind of vice to break the shell open. Um, so, now we have a lot of questions about choosing the right trees. So let's start with this one. Are there trees that naturally grow better together? And let me, before I, you get in, answer that, let me get into a little bit more about that question. Because for example, Suzanne Simard, I think her name is the lady who wrote um, Intelligent Trees, you know, or I mean, the, the lady who wrote the, Finding the Mother Tree. She discovered that, um, that paper birch and Douglas fir grow better together because of the mycelium and the mycorrhizomes, uh, you know, growing underneath them provide, they provide optimum nutrients to each other through that. And, and I also noticed that when I go um, mushroom hunting for morel mushrooms, you know, the morel mushrooms actually grow better under poplar trees and ash trees 
but they're not so, they don't grow so well where you're going to find oaks and hickories. And so now I'm wondering, is it better to have those oaks and hickories together, just like in the same sense of the mycorrhizomes in symbiotic relationship or? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think there's as much literature on that as, as there should be to, to answer that question, yes or no. Um, I know that there are certain trees that grow in stands. And um, like you mentioned, the poplar will grow in stands. Yeah. Uh, so any tree that grows naturally in a stand will want to be planted close to another member of the same species. Uh, and then, yeah, so I would, I guess you could kind of look at it as like a companion planting, where if you're talking about oak hickory, those go together. Maple birch, those go together. Uh, so I would, I would look at it in those kinds of terms of um, what, what, or what, um, what do they call it? A plant community and their associates. What is it, what is associating in this plant community? And you could work on that now. Yeah. You know, that's, that would be really helpful to know because if you're, especially if you're doing your own backyard, you know, when you're trying to pick what plants to grow back there, um, is there a place where people can find that information? Yes, um, I actually found there was a, um, a, a group that, that went around trying to find every single possible ecosystem on, in, the, in the east from like Maine down to Florida and they did it and I can get that uh, sent out to anybody who would like. I'll, I'll have to do a little digging to find it, but it's, it's there. You know, that would be fantastic if you could do that because this video is going to be posted onto YouTube anyways and we can post that link under the video. Yeah. So that people, yeah, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, Okay, and so now somebody asked, uh, okay, how do we know what type of trees would be best for streets versus backyards versus parks? So, I mean, that, to me, that comes with experience because you would have um, these books that are written that say, uh, for example, English oak in New York City was thought to be a tree that does not do good in urban environments. It's really only a park tree. But somebody had a bunch of English oaks that they had to get rid of, and they put them in a median in the industrial heart of Brooklyn, and they are thriving while the honey locust, which is traditionally planted in those kind of locations, is, is not doing so well at all. So I, I say you got to go out and look. Walk around the blocks, try to determine which trees are doing the best and find out what species they are, and um, you know build up your own um, list, As, especially because the conditions are going to change from one location to the other. So you really don't want someone from Colorado telling you that, you know, oh yeah, th this tree does just, just fine in downtown Denver. And like, okay, well, you know, Bergen County is nothing like downtown Denver. So it, yeah. it's going to be, you really do want to do it yourself and, and take a look. Um, there are some books uh, on plants that are almost like encyclopedias. Um, oh, I have one around here. Hold on, let me find it. Uh, I'm, I'm not finding it now, but it's it's essentially called like the um, the Arborist's Bible, uh, this okay. is, and um, there's a couple versions of it, and it's pretty good to start with. But again, I would say go out on your own, and if you have the the opportunity to try some things that you know uh, uh, if you have extra trees left over, do some experiments. I did some experiments when I was a forester in New York City. Um, some of them were very successful, some less so, but yeah. it, it's how we, we, we learn about these things. Well, you know, that the link to that book, we'll send it to us and we'll put it you know, on the YouTube, under the YouTube video <laughs> as well. And, um, you know, I have a, okay, since we're on this topic, I had read an article by Nancy Lawson. She's the author of um, The Humane Gardener, that, that book. And there was this, this always this stuck with me. She said that the silver, the native silver maple is just really, you know, people are not planting enough of them anymore. And they're so extremely beneficial uh, to wildlife. And the reason why a lot of people aren't planting them is because, of, um, you know, well, because we're actually, they're not being planted on the streets because their roots are just so shallow and thick and heavy that they can make the sidewalks, you know, buckle and the and this tree, you know, the street buckle. 
but that would be a perfect treat for a person's backyard, you know? Yes. Just, you know, yeah. You know. One of the other things about silver maples is they put on a tremendous amount of growth. Um, I was seeing silver maples in Staten Island that were over six feet in diameter, four feet off the ground. And um, yeah. this That's tree, it, it had, it, one of the problems that it had was it had co-dominant stems. So instead of, you know, a central leader branching out, it, it kind of branched out into four or five all at once. And um, they split apart because oh. that, that tree is known for being weak wooded and for having poor growth structure. But the way around that is just to prune it when it's young. If you prune it when it's young, you can you can train it, and that's called structural pruning. So you'll have a better structure as it grows older, and you won't have to worry about it. Ah, okay, that's a good idea. I have one in my backyard that was already pruned, and it's it's growing nice and straight. I just love it. I just I love that tree. Um, now it says, what's the next one? Okay, so. On a street block with, let's say, about 10 trees, how many different species and what recommendations would you have? Like, like well, you know. So, so the way I would look at it, I, I think an individual street may be too small of a management area when you're we're talking about diversity, um, especially when you say that, you know, there's only 10 trees. That's not a large sample size. Yeah. So I would kind of look at, you know, maybe the neighborhood. And and kind of go from that and say, okay, well, um, sometimes people do it by the, um, the what do you call it, the zones that the town has set up, you know, voting zones or school zones, whatever it is. So you, the town probably already has um, it, it zones split up throughout the town, and I think you might be able to get a better idea using one or two or possibly even three of those manage of those zones as your management area and focusing on. Um, all those trees together. That's a really good answer to the question. Someone, as you were saying that, uh, Sarah Roberts uh, mentioned to plant a silver maple in a moist, windy spot. The wind will strengthen it, and they are very strong on lake fronts. I didn't ever think of that. They they are very good uh, along water. Uh, yeah, and, and well, Staten Island is very soggy, and so it's no surprise that they they do very well there. Gosh, yeah, because, you know, I always think when lakefronts, I always think of ri like river birches, and I never thought of a silver, silver maple on a riverfront. It's really there are, um, there's a state park in New Jersey called the Raritan Confluence State Park. Uh -huh. uh, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's where the North and South Branch come together. And there are a number of absolute monster silver maples growing along the banks. Oh, wow. That's and this, that must be gorgeous, like in the fall, because the colors of the silver yeah. maple in the fall, they're just so rich. They're like red and orange and yellow. And it's just, uh, and, you know, and, you know, and you see everybody planted these Norwegian maples, which is an invasive species now. And the Norwegian maples just turn yellow, like just only like a plain Jane yellow in the fall. And it's like, why? When yeah. we have these beautiful, gorgeous, they all, native red maples and silver maples that make these incredible colors, like why, you know? Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, they also get maple decline. So most of the, the Norway maples, they can't handle the street tree plantings for very long. So you see them get to 40, 50 years old and then they just fall apart. Okay. So, and, and you're talking about the native ones or the-, the No, the Norways. So Norway. not only are they invasive, yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not hardy trees for streets. They're fast growing, but they don't belong planted along streets. Yeah, and then also the, the crimson maple is also a Norway maple. It's yes. just a variety of it, right? Correct. It's just so a red leaf whole... variety. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and for sure, the, I, there's a blight on that one as well, isn't there? Because I've noticed like that all of the crimson maples and Norway maples in my town are just dying. They're just... Yeah, it's probably maple decline. Yeah, okay. And um, all right, so let me see, let me move on. So, the, okay, now we have questions about uh, working with townships. And we have a lot of questions about people want you as a consultant. <laughs> so <laughs> there's like a lot of excitement, like, hey, can we hire you? <laughs> you know, come back in my yard. Um, can they? Can they actually yeah, hire you yeah, for you, you their can, private um... yard? And, Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you go to my, my webpage, you'll find the contact info 
just send me some messages. Um, the easiest way to reach me is email because I, I use email more than I use my phone to call. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me and we can work something out. Okay, and, and you can um, you can consult them on their private yards on, on public places and commercial properties and even with their town issues. Can you do all that stuff? Like you're pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm in the process of registering with the state of New Jersey to be able to do um, some of these uh, yeah, municipal jobs. So certainly, yeah, I, I can come out and, and help. Um, what I'm looking to do this winter is to offer training courses uh, that will give credits for core and ISA certifications. So if anybody wants to get certified, you know, in, in the fall, um, in October at the, the, the general meeting, then we'll have the CEU uh, eligible courses throughout the winter. Um, I had another question. So, okay, so say, for example, somebody's working on their shade tree commission, and um, would they be able to just reach out to you? Like, would you just like, like, if they have a general question and things like that, you think like- Yeah, if it's just a, a, just a quick question, you're just wondering, you know, what I'm thinking about it. Yeah, shoot me an email, that's fine. Okay, that's great. Okay, now let me see. Uh, oh, and it's so funny, that was a question here. Any advice for helping to start a shade tree commission in someone's township? Oh, uh, you're going to need, I think, about five people. And um, there is a process. The state of New Jersey uh, Community Forestry, that's the, that's the, the title of that division. Um, the, of, I'm sorry, the, the DEP, Div Div uh, Department of Environmental Protection, has a community forestry division. Those are the people that will help you get the paperwork and let you know um, whether you can become a commission or a committee or um, a board, et cetera. There's, there's a few distinctions that have some some legal differences. I had no idea. Wow. But the, um, geez, okay, maybe that that would be a good link to to send us so that we can put on the YouTube video as well. We'll we'll get a whole bunch of shade tree commissions now. Um, okay. Well, there's also funding for it as well. Um, so yeah, so so one of the benefits of having a shade tree commission is you're eligible to get funding from the state to do an inventory, to do tree planting, to do maintenance. There, there's a whole lot of things that um, that are available and uh, it, it literally cannot be used for anything other than shade tree management in, in municipal you know, municipal areas. You know, well, that's half the battle because usually the biggest issue and problem is trying to raise money. And so that's, there you go. Okay, and so now there's, um, someone wants to know, are you certified in New York State? So my ISA certification is the only thing that's uh, required by any municipalities um, in New York State that I know of. So yeah, I'm, I'm available for work in New York. Okay, good, because I think we have someone here from New York. So that's <laughs> why you got that question. Um, now, are there any programs giving away native trees? I bet there trees? are. Um, uh, it's one of those things like you're going to have to troll or not troll. Um, Troll, uh, troll, uh, Facebook and Instagram and um, Twitter for those kind of posts. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of anybody like offhand, but I know it happens all the time. I know it, it every year someone's giving away saplings or seedlings or etc. So it, yeah, it's think... it happens. Usually Arbor Day is the big day for it, but yeah. I will not be surprised if if it goes on almost year round. You know, it's it's. Gisela, the, the president of the board for Wild Ones New Jersey Gateway Chapter, who is talking at the beginning here, she actually knows of all of the places where they're giving them away for free. And, yeah. um, and she <laughs> said that in the end, she'll actually do a drive-by. She'll go to every single place afterwards because a lot of, they end up having a lot of leftovers. And so she goes and she collects all of their leftovers. She brings them home. She mommies them. And then she still continues to give them away. So nothing goes wasted, Ms. Gisella. <laughs> There's a hand clap right now in the comments for her. Um, okay, so uh, any idea? Oops. All right, so um, that link that I just put in there, that's the link to, um, to Michael Durr. And he's the one, it's called The Tree Book. And that's the one that everybody kind of refers to. Um, Again, I, I think um, I, I, have, I have a few bones to pick with him about some of the things that he's written, yeah. but uh, for the most part, it, I would trust what's in that book. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but next time you have to tell me about those bones that you would like to pick. I, I want to know about that. Like what's what's in there that you don't agree with. Um, uh, if, if, you know, at a different time, if you don't want to mention it now. Well, no, it's just it's just those random things that you see in in New York that or in Jersey City or something that um, are uncommon in other places. So, like like I'm saying, like the English oak, they were they were not just regular English oak; they were fastigiate. And for some reason, the fastigiate ones do just fine in the worst environments that we have. Um, and Mike does disagrees. He says they're mm -hmm. a park tree only. And I'm, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, now that's well known, and and everyone who reads that book will understand that that they'll do just fine. Um, so, any idea on who we could? Oh, I can't see that question here. Okay, uh, any idea on who we could usually contact at our local government if we want a native tree planted on our block? Yeah. So the first thing to do is check if there's a shade tree committee or commission. Um, okay. And sometimes environmental commissions will also do this work, but that's usually the, uh, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, if there is no commission or committee, it'll probably be the DPW. Um, and if your DPW says we don't do that, uh, here's a guy who, who will do it. So, um, <laughs> so let me know. <laughs> and you, can you like, if, if you have that, 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 you know, strip of land between your sidewalk and your road. Can you just go ahead and stick one there yourself if it's in front that's of your gonna, house? Or do you that's going to depend on on towns on what their rules are. Some will say that um, you can do almost whatever you want. Some will say you need a permit. Some will say only the town can do it. Um, so yeah, you. I, I mean, most of the time, if you put something in there, no one's really coming around to say anything. I mean, even in in New York City, we, we weren't supposed to allow anyone to do that. And if we saw someone put in a planting, we would just be like, I, I guess, they're, you know, someone's growing an apple tree there now. I, I like I have more things to do than to than to like call up parks enforcement and have them give you a citation for planting a tree. Like that's right. the last thing I want to do. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah. Now, your town might object and they might say, well, it's under power lines and they might not care that you planted a small tree that's appropriate for the space. So you might have to have a permit or you might just need to talk to someone from DPW or whatever. Uh, okay. But yeah, that's going to vary town to town. Okay. Okay. Let's see. There's another question that popped up. Uh, okay. So this is a one question that just popped up just now. Um, it's the fencing. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So I, I would say that's not tall enough. If you're trying to keep out deer, that needs to be six to seven feet tall. Okay, and the question that he just answered was, uh, what do you think of putting 18 inch high tree oh. fencing around newly planted trees? Um, what do you think of eight or oh, So, okay, I, so that 18 inch high fencing, that would be like on the sidewalk around, um, it's, it's the cast iron. I know what you're talking about. The, the tree guards, we call yeah. them, the cast iron tree guards. Yeah, yeah I, I'm. I think that's just fine. In fact, I was I advising people to say, uh, put a, a fold down bench on the on the side of it. That way, people can fold it down and sit in the shade. Now, some people will say, "Oh, this encourages loitering, or it, it gives the homeless a place to go." And I think, like, if that's your problem, then you know the tree guard is not the issue here. There's something else going on in in this area that needs to be worked out. Um, so I don't subscribe to that idea at all that tree guards with seating uh, contributes to to um, you know degradation of public spaces. I don't buy it, um, especially when you see all the old men playing dominoes with their folding chairs underneath the trees, and you think, what, why not just give them a bench on their own or, or whatever? You know, um, the gator bags I am not in favor of because of a psychological phenomena. People see the bags on the trees and they think someone else is filling the bags. So nobody fills the bags. Now, if you are personally going to fill the bag, go for it. That's a, a fine way to do it. But if you're just gonna put bags on there and expect that it's gonna be done by someone else, I can guarantee you it will not happen. Oh my gosh. 
Wow. Well, okay. That's that, I. I never thought of that. That's good advice. And uh, regarding regarding the homeless under the trees, we have to have empathy for homeless people too, not just trees. <laughs> you know, it's like if you love the tree, you you have to love everybody. Um. So okay. And uh, then it says, how can we get our township to invest in native trees? Any advice? Yeah. Um. Go to the community forestry page and apply for a grant. Get a tree planting grant, get an inventory grant, or, you know, get, um, uh, they might say you need a management plan first. So, okay, you, you can get, I can write a management plan. I've done it before. That's pretty easy. I mean, you could do it yourself if you wanted to. Uh, they'll give you the templates and they'll walk you through it. Um, so, yeah, so you go through the state, get the grants, you'll be just fine. Then it says, um, yeah, yeah, here's the next question just about that. Like, should we bring them a management plan and how can people make a management plan? Yeah, so again, um, community forestry is your resource there because they'll tell you what are the current requirements. Uh, it doesn't change all that often, but I suspect some things have changed in the, the 15 years since I've been looking at these things and helping to write them. You know, I, I have, I'll be honest, I haven't touched a, a management plan in over 10 years. Um, so I'm sure there are some minor differences now than when I was doing it. Uh, but yeah, they'll have all the information. They do pretty good job of responding to people. When I send them questions, I get answers back within a day or two. So yeah, I, I would not worry that this is some, you know, giant faceless bureaucracy where you're not going to hear from anybody, uh, or get anything constructive from them. Um, they're, they're pretty responsive and they all care about what they do. So I like those people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, well, I, used to, I used to work with them, you know, there's still a really? few people there that I used to, that, that was my first job as an urban forester was a seasonal forester with community forestry planting trees all over New Jersey. Oh, where in any like any one area that you, that you were a lot or a lot about? in Union City, West New York area. Uh, what, what type what mean what were the main species you're planting when you're doing that? Oh, I remember hawthorns and red oaks. I know there were others, but that's all I remember. Do you ever drive by them and say, oh my God. I did a few times. Things? Yeah, the last time mm -hmm. I drove by, they were still there. Oh, and they're like, do they like grow better and, and larger than you're expecting or? Yeah, the, um, they're, uh, yeah, they're still doing okay as far as I know. So hopefully that continues. I just I love I love driving by trees that were little when I was little and seeing them now like how big they are. Um, okay, so now we have questions about specific situations. Um, so somebody says that we or is asking says that we have a seventy year old black walnut black walnut tree uh, that I was recently told should come down because it is poisonous to most wildlife. What? Nonsense. Nonsense. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't read this ahead of time. So <laughs> verify or point me in the right direction so I can protect it. Yeah. No, it's highly beneficial to wildlife people. The yeah. Black walnuts are fantastic trees. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of things that people think are poisonous too. Like for example, um, Jumocladus dialicus is called the Kentucky coffee tree. And mm -hmm. someone recently said to me, he said, you know, they planted one in front of my house and I'm afraid that, you know, my dog is going to eat it and die. I'm like, first of all, your dog is not going to be eating the seed pods of this thing. Second of all, it's not that poisonous. Like it's relax. It's, it's like yeah. mildly toxic to some animals. Some again, mm -hmm. like, the, uh, so any tree that's producing these fruits or these seeds or these nuts, it wants them to be eaten. That's the yeah. whole point. So yeah. it's for someone to say that a walnut is poisonous is just ludicrous because that's the whole reason why the tree produces them in the first place is so that it gets eaten and dispersed. Yeah. And and so like I know a lot about black walnuts because you know my hobby is wild edibles and I've collected and processed a tremendous amount of black walnuts and husk them and everything. So one I think what they could have been told about the black walnut. Is you know it's certainly not poisonous. That the the nut meat in it is absolutely delicious, and you know add you know you can remove it from the husk and then you roast it and it's really good. Um, but, you know we used to collect them for when I was uh, volunteering at a um 
a wildlife sanctuary. We used to cut them and crack them open to give to the baby squirrels to so introduce them to their foods. But the the thing that they could have been told is that koala, it's like the husk itself has a chemical in it that will pretty much kill off everything growing around the husk to make that walnut um, have a better, you know. Uh, yeah, it, it, it can be used. Yeah. It, it, it can be used to make a stain, like a wood stain or a, a cloth stain or, you know, dye. Um, so it definitely does have in, in well, it, what do you call it, in, 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 in the rinds, um, some chemicals that are probably not particularly nice to ingest, but there's no animal that's eating the rinds and getting sick from it. They just don't do that. Yeah, and 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 so it's like the the when the nuts and fall down on the ground, they can inhibit the growth of certain plants like tomato plants and things like that. So if somebody's trying to do a garden, they they realize that that black walnut is inhibiting the growth of their vegetables. But you know, just plant your garden somewhere else because don't cut. I've heard of so many people cutting down their black walnut wait, wait. tree because of that. Better better idea, harvest the walnuts. Exactly right. And um, and and there are a lot of native plants that can grow very well underneath a black walnut that are adapted to those allelopathic properties. So don't worry about your black walnut. Just please yeah. keep it there. If you're worried that it's you can't grow your garden underneath it, then just move your garden. You absolutely can harvest those walnuts. the The shell itself is great for um. It's been traditionally used to make dyes, like he was saying, fabric dyes, hair dyes, everything like that. And um, and also the shell is is loaded with like antivirals and antibacterials that are really good for the wildlife that do actually eat the nuts because they do chew away the shell even though they don't eat the shell they're still getting the shell in their mouth and they're benefiting from the antiviral properties that keeps them healthy throughout the winter so please 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 cherish your black walnuts um, and so the next question is. Uh, with all the ashes dying, what trees can we plant to replace it? And should we allow uh, ash saplings to grow? So, so some, the one theory is that if we let all the ash die, but we save seeds, or we keep growing them in areas where the emerald ash borer just can't get to, we can wait till all the emerald ash borer eat their, themselves out of a food source, and then reintroduce the ash. I mean, it okay. sounds good on yeah. paper. I don't know if that's really going to work. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll find out over the next 10 years or so. Um, so I would try to find out, you know, if there's what this, what the New Jersey DEP suggests for the area, you know, because um, there, so it's going to be your state environmental protection agencies that are going to be organizing any efforts, if anybody's going to be doing it at all. Um, so I would try to find out what they suggest to do because they may have a plan. I know they, they had uh, with ALB, um, Asian Longhorn Beetle, they were very aggressive in their pursuit of it and, um, maybe too aggressive, uh, but they were, they had a plan and it, and it worked. So the quarantine zones and the, um, the no planting of certain species, you know, it had to be done for a few years, but. Uh, following that plan did essentially get us out of the um, the, the problems we were having. So I would I would check with yeah the, your state forestry offices on what they're trying to do about it. Um, you know, yeah, that's what and, and the second part, what to plant in place. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you like um, gymnocladus dialicus? You know, <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the common name to that? Uh, that is, um, oh, I just said it a minute ago too. Kentucky coffee tree. Um, so the Kentucky hunt, coffee, the yeah. Kentucky coffee tree is one of those ones that's like quasi-native to New Jersey because yeah. some people say, oh, it's it's originally its range never came here. Other people say, ah, you can find pockets of it in places. I'm not an expert on on um on this, um, but I think it's natural na native enough. I would say. You're, it's not going to be becoming invasive. It's it's not going to be causing problems, and it has the same kind of leaf structure. The branching structure is going to be a little different. It's not probably not going to get as big as um, an ash, uh, but yeah, just you know, I I think a, a black walnut would be a good um, replacement. That that has a similar tree. Uh, 
shape, yeah. similar uh, size, and also similar leaf. Yeah, and um, actually, you know what? No, oh, American I, I, elm. Sorry, I, I someone just said um, disease resistant American elm. Yes, yes, that is also um, advisable. Okay, and um, how about like an oak tree? Because you know the oak tree is a keystone tree. So when, when you want to get as many of those in there as possible. Yeah, but I, I have a feeling like a lot of like we have a lot of oak trees to begin with, though. We do have thousands of pin oaks and thousands of red oaks. Um, and we don't have as many as some of these other species. So I wouldn't yeah, say that we yeah. shouldn't be planting them, but the proportion to to get the extras in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so I would lean towards these species that are less well represented first and then, you know um head towards the oaks uh i i don't think new jersey is ever going to be without oaks but um yeah, okay. yeah how about like shag bark hickory i like that um it also has a very interesting you know bark that's peeling off and so it's okay. something interesting to look at in the winter that's something else to think about too like the birch has exfoliating bark um and some of the trees some trees like the um uh, Cretagus, the uh, hawthorns, they will also sometimes have very interesting bark patterns and and then also the red berries. So it, it's, they call it like winter aesthetics. Yeah, right. And not only that, the reason why I, I like the shag bark hickories is, not, is because the, the nut is edible and because the um, the shaggy bark is habitat for bats or native <clears> bats. <throat> yep, and, yeah. and we're just losing native bat habitat. So we just want like that's that's why I'm like, and how do you feel about that? Do you feel like there was, that's like one of the underrepresented trees? or Jackbark hickory, yeah, for sure. Um, especially in Bergen County. I mean, I, I think we probably do not have the species richness in most places that you, that you do, um, like in central Jersey. I think it's, and south, south Jersey also has more species richness. Uh, the Pine Barrens is altogether different. That's its own ecosystem. So I would not be comparing to that. So let me see. Now, someone says I have an old non native weeping willow that is slowly dying. I don't want to cut it yet. Can I plant a young tree close to it? Yeah, you could put in black willow, Silex nigra, or oh. Silex nigra. That, that's a native. So you can and have it, that one just take up that spot, and then you can have a willow tree that's native and you don't have to worry about it. How close? So should she put it under the tree line or just outside of the tree line? It depends what the space is. It depends how, so yeah, I mean, because if you have uh, a large backyard and it doesn't matter if it's moved 10 feet over one way or the next, that's fine. But if you've got a patio that's 10 feet from the tree on one side and a sidewalk that's five feet from the tree on the other, you, you're limited in where you can now move that new one. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so I would say it's it's not necessarily so much um, well, you wouldn't want to put it directly next to the tree anyway, because then you'd be cutting into the roots, the main structural roots, to just to get it in. Um, yeah. Unless you bare rooted it at the top, uh, staked and tied it with extra topsoil, that would be an experiment. I would, I would be very happy to try it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it would be, it would be a creative way to plant a tree for sure. Um, but I'm game. I, I wish I had a big enough backyard to try it. I would try it all. Um, so, but also like the willow tree is a water loving tree. So that would be a great place to plant if in an area where you want to try to absorb like extra water that may be going, you know, is yeah, it? Yeah, like I was saying, those depressions, you know, even in the park that, you know, in Staten Island, it's only an elevation change of one foot, but it's, it's, you know, it's a little bowl and you can see that it's a little bowl, but just that one foot made that much of a difference. And it was, it was pooling water and then flooding. Yeah, so, yeah. No, you know, nothing else could really grow there. How about for people like, for example, their basements flood a lot and things like that. Can they put like a nice big willow tree right next to their house in their yard where, you know, to try to control some of that flooding that they get in their yard? And uh, it, It'll help, but I don't think it's going to solve the flooding problem. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah I mean, it, 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 it won't hurt. That's, you know, the only the other thing too that people worry about is, you know, the tree getting into the foundation. and if the foundation doesn't have any holes or cracks in it, the roots can't get in. The, 
the roots cannot burrow through the concrete. What they can do is find an existing crack or hole and follow the water into it and exploit it that way. So, but this can also be solved by plastic sheeting in front of um, the, the foundation. Uh, they call it a root guard. It's really simple. It's just, it's just a plastic piece that's you know two feet tall, and it comes in these rectangles, and you just literally just hammer it into the ground, and then the roots hit it, and they they they, they go a different direction. Um, I mean, I, I don't love the idea of putting plastic in the ground for long yeah. periods of time, but if the choice is a little bit of plastic or no tree and a tree or no plastic and no tree, I think you can make a case that there are some plastics that would be safe for that use. Yeah. And on this, since we're on this topic, what kind of trees do you recommend planting close to a house? Is, you know, I don't. I, okay. so, well, one of the things that people ask is, you know, how close to the house should it be? Half the distance of its, of its uh, mature height. Is, is like the rule of thumb. So if a tree so, can it will grow up at like 50 feet in diameter, then you want it, your tree to at least, at least 25 feet away from your house. Is correct, yeah. And there's a few reasons for that. One, it's just to give the tree enough room to grow, to actually you know have its branches go out and, and put out leaves and photosynthesize. Uh, you want the root space and also the maintenance. It's so much more work if the tree is 10 feet from the house than if it's 25. Right. So right. it just makes sense for everybody just to do that. Um, there are some situations where that's not going to be possible, but you know, you could also look at like a white pine and say, all right, you know, if I can get this white pine to grow, you know, taller than the roof, then it's fine because the white pines um, don't really keep the branches uh, lower than the very top of their canopy. They're, it's, that's their growth pattern. So you, you could do something like that or get a fastidious ver variation of a, tr um, of a native tree. I know. There are some people that are not quite fond of the cultivated varieties, but again, if the option is no tree, I would lean towards the fastidious or column-shaped variety of a native. Okay. Yeah, and and the white pine is highly beneficial for absolutely everybody, especially if we're going through Armageddon, because the pine. The, the pine needles of a white pine are edible, like you can make a tea out of them that are very high in vitamin yes. C. And so it's just just an incredibly beneficial tree to have if there's ever a supply chain shortage, you can't get your fruits and vegetables, just make get yourself some pine needles and yeah. tea and prevent your skirt and so you won't get scurvy. Um, okay, so last question, unless anyone else has any more, I'll put them in the chat. Uh, how can we protect our non-salt tolerant trees? So there's there's things you can do to the soil. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest is use biochar. And biochar comes in a couple different types. Uh, you're going to have to do some research on the company that's making it and what they're getting the source material from, because garbage in, garbage out. And so Wait, essentially, okay. yeah. what, essentially what biochar is, is they take um, organic material, whether it's leaves or grasses or, or wood or whatever, what have you, they put it in a container and they remove the oxygen and then they heat it to the point where it burns. But because there's no oxygen, it can't fully burn. So it pyrolyzes instead. And what you're left with is a black powder that is really, really good for conditioning the soil. Um, this was done in the Amazon thousands of years ago uh, when they had cities in the Amazon, and they they called it Terra Preta when they found it. Um, so yeah, yeah I've heard so, of this, yeah. so you you take the biochar and you, you, the, whatever box you get or wherever you get it from, we'll have instructions. You can mix that in, and what that will do is increase the buffering capacity of the soil, so that way um, the salts just don't affect things as much as they normally would. A lot of it will get bound up in the biochar and sequestered. You can also use um, a soil flush. There, there are some um, chemical, uh, I don't want to say chemicals, there's some solutions and solvents that you can use. Now, I'm not certain on how organic or how safe um, all of them are. Uh, that's something that I would suggest researching before just purchasing and, and putting in the soil. But I believe Bartlett Tree Service has um, some that they sell. So I would expect that anything coming from them has been vetted. Uh, again, 
I would say do your research. Don't don't take my word or Bartlett's sales page for it. But um, yeah. So there's and then you could also just make sure that you're you're adding compost and and water to it um, in the spring to try to to flush out anything else that that may have built up. Uh, and then the last thing is try to use anything except a salt that's going to damage the plants. Uh, there, you know, hot water sometimes is, is can you know if it, if if you're just trying to break up the ice, hot water is fine. Right. Um, if you know you'll have a little thin ice sheet afterwards, but that's better than chunks of it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure there's other things out there too that are you know tree safe. Uh, de-icers. Um, and then again, also the engineering of it. You know, do you have room to dig a little trench and bury a drain, uh, a PVC pipe with some holes in it? Because then, you know, that water that's that's flushing off of the sidewalk with that salt can go in there and be redirected first. You might be losing some water to that planting area then, uh, depending on how the sidewalk has been pitched, you know, over the years. But I, I, yeah, you have a number, there's a number of options to, to get around it and everything from don't use regular salts to um, change the soil structure with these, these um, amendments to, to give it greater buffering capacity. Well, not only that, but you don't need as much salt as you think you need to break down that ice. You just need a few little sprinkles. And, and whereas people would throw cupfuls, whereas a, a cupful is enough for you probably, you know, several driveways or so like a huge parking lot. You just, you need a lot less salt than you think you need to break through that ice. Um, okay, so let me see. Any last, okay, so any last thoughts that you wanna share, Ryan, before we uh, close? No, I, th I think we got to everything. And yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to, to reach out to me. And you know, if you're worried, am I going to bill you for it? I will let you know up front if it's something that I can just talk to you about, or if it's something I need a bill. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Fantastic. And Haley just put a, a link to your um, ecological consultants uh, business here, so and you can find it right at the bottom of the chat. And uh, oh, look at Gisela. The president said this has been so informative. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for being a friend of Wild Ones. Keep on saving trees and being a voice for them. Thank you, Gisela. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, everybody. Great to be thank here. You, thank you, everybody. So now I'm going to um, pass this along to say thank you to Ryan and thanks to, to everybody for being here. This was just such a great uh, presentation. It's been incredibly informative. So I'm going to pass this along to Haley and Haley is a member of our board. Um, and she does uh, membership, social media. She's the one doing all of this technical stuff behind the scenes and keeping track of the chats. We just, you know, we just wouldn't be the same without Haley and we're, we're so incredibly appreciative of you. Haley, take over. Bye. <laughs> all right, yeah, so we're in our closing statements. Um, thank you guys all so, so, so much for joining us. We are really grateful for all of your questions and your participation in this event tonight. And Ryan, big shout out for the amazing presentation. Thank you so much for this informative, um, you know, information about our street trees, our backyard trees, and how they can help each other and coexist in a way that's a able to benefit not only our native species, our you know other birds, butterflies, the you know, pollinators, the community that we have here, but also each other. And it's just a really grateful to have your insight shared with us. And thank you again. Um, I'm going to share uh, his page so that you guys can reach out. You know, as he said, he does do consulting for, um, you know, private properties as well as public properties. And he's getting his certification in New Jersey, but he already has a certification in New York. So please feel free to reach out. Um, so that you know you guys can get that one on one uh, care that you need for your own gardens. Um, so now to finish up, just wanted to talk about some upcoming events that we're going to have. Um, we are going to have a hike coming soon. It's not scheduled yet, but please feel free to keep an eye on our Facebook and our Instagram where we share all of that information to let you guys know 
what we are up to and um, as well as our newsletter. So if you would like to um, be a part of our newsletter, you're welcome to share a thumbs up in the chat or a little heart, um, or you can just use the link that I currently sent, uh, which will allow you to sign up that way and we will add you to our newsletter list. Um, so to continue on, another big event, which is a really exciting thing um, from our uh, president, Gisela, she applied for the Xerces grant um, with the Xerces Society, which is an organization here, let me send the link to that as well. Um, they're an organization that helps to bring more um, conservation efforts to our communities. Here's a little bit more about them. Um, and we were able to, through Gisela's uh, work um, in Hackensack, win a, uh, or be rewarded a uh, 1,100 native plugs for um, the Jackson Avenue School in Hackensack. And so we were going to be planting those plugs this June 17th and June 19th, which are a Saturday and a Monday. So please feel free to check out that link that I just sent in the chat. If you'd like to volunteer with us, get your hands dirty, learn a little bit more about native plants and how they can work well together in this setting. Um, it's a really amazing opportunity and we're super grateful that we were chosen for this grant. And we also got $750 from the Audubon Society to continue planting more. Um, so this is a really, really amazing opportunity to help Hackensack, help New Jersey um, reinvest in their native uh, infrastructure. And to continue on in that volunteer form as well, you'll see um, sections for helping out our chapter with our organizational and outreach needs. This is something that is super, super important and would be so, would be so, so, so grateful if you guys don't mind checking it out and seeing if there's any way that you can help us with some of these roles, um, including our secretary position, which would be part of the board, which we're looking for, um, as well as some really small roles, um, things that are just you know, maybe one hour a week, two hours a week, or every other week, um, including a proofreader and a formatter for our newsletters, um, a publicity assistant to help us get our events out um, into the, you know, community to let people know more, um, a program coordinator to help us figure out, you know, different events that we can do, uh, as well as a grants and business partnerships helper, uh, somebody that can help us point uh, point us to the right direction to grants that we can apply for and help us apply for them, a nominating committee, which will help us pick our um, future board members in um, future years, uh, and most importantly, a plant ID botanist. This is extremely important for our newsletters and our social media. We really would love and appreciate the help to be able to send somebody who knows thoroughly what native plants are um, you know, what they look like so that we're able to share with people and what native plants don't look like, what, what the invasives look like as well. So that when we're sharing on social media and when we're sharing with our community, we are sharing the right information about what native, um, these native plants look like. Um, so yes, to continue on the YouTube, um, I'm sending the YouTube link in the chat as well, which is where you can watch this recording. If you ended up missing any of the webinar, please feel free to, you know, check out our YouTube channel. You're welcome to subscribe if you want to. Um, and this, this is where we post all of our webinars. Um, we haven't posted the last webinar just because of the, um, uh, my computer problems, but we'll we'll get to it very soon. But this one should be posted within the next week, which is super exciting. And we will get that information from Ryan. Um, I know we got the tree book, but I know there was another um, thing that we were going to get from him as well. So we will include that in there. Um, and yeah, other than that, you know, the way that we're able to make this happen, the way that this organization and I, on a national level, um, but also on a, you know, local level is being able to have members. And this membership is such a great way to, um, you know, support your 
local native community as well as your national native communities you know this is a great present for a family member if you have a if someone's birthday is coming up or a holiday is coming up where you feel like oh i don't know what to get them this is a beautiful way to show them like i care about you and i know that you care about the environment so this is a way that you know we're making a difference um so we'd really appreciate you guys feel free to become a member if you're not already and yeah other than that we are so grateful to have you here i see ryan has sent me um the link that we were looking for as well which is super awesome so let me send that in the chat um so if you had heard earlier um this is uh you know community and urban forestry um, of new jersey so you guys can check that out but thank you again so much ryan for all of your advice your insight your answering the questions for the webinar it is so so appreciated thank you thank you so much and um and thank you to everyone for being here if you have any questions feel free we'll add you to the newsletter um yeah thank you guys for coming <laughs> bye oh and thank bye. you to the, the team bye. yes thank you thank to the you. wild ones and your gateway team we couldn't do this without you guys bye 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 bye